What is going on, guys? Welcome back. Commentary for you, Jimmy Smith, Ryan Moody, our MMA show. Jimmy, we're going to recap UFC 250, but I feel like we have to start off by addressing Conor McGregor because he retired immediately, no after, immediately after this event. God forbid, God forbid anyone else just get a microcosm of the limelight is how I felt. Did you feel the same way? Was it not a, a little bit ill-timed? Exactly. 100%. Like, even if he means it, which I don't believe, even if he means it, to do it right after a show where an all-time great had a, another fantastic performance and there were all these great knockouts, really, you're going to interject yourself into that conversation when you don't have to, when you could have announced it the next week, the next day, even if you believe it, which I don't believe he believes it. I, I, I thought it was, let's say, in poor taste is the best way to put it. Do you think he could have been confused? By seeing someone defend a belt, which he's not done, and been unsure of how MMA belt lineage works? <sighs> it could be a lot of things. Um, w w which one it is, I don't know. What triggered this particular uh, outburst, I guess, this, this announcement, I, I don't know. I've given up on trying to figure out what's in that guy's head and what he wants for the future. He just always wants to be in the news, which makes it inc in increasingly less likely that he's actually retiring because they're addicted to the limelight. He's addicted to the limelight. He's not going to let it go. What, what also interests me is before this event, and it kind of flew under the radar, they acknowledged that the classic style, if you will, belt was no longer going to be utilized in competition. And we knew tonight would be the last, well, we yesterday rather, would have been the last night that we would have actually seen it with Amanda Nunes. So to a degree, there is a concept of immediately any new fan that comes in is going to look at Connor, all respect to the champ champ, but those belts are no longer going to be resonated with someone that's not watched the sport within the last you know handful of months or year. Maybe, but his his name recognition and his name value are off the chart. If any casual fan knows one name, it's Conor McGregor. Uh, people who have nothing to do with MMA know who the guy is. I, I don't think it's that. I, I don't know exactly what it is. His statement of his reason why is ridiculous. There are no good matchups for me at 55. There's no, it's not exciting right now. 55 is a shark tank. There are no bad matches for you at 55. There are none. There might, might be some you don't want. There might be no good ones that are what you like, which is a ton of money for somebody who's not exactly relevant in the top 10. Uh, but beyond that, I, I don't – his statement made no sense at all. It made none. So his reason for wanting to quit, there are no good matchups for me, is just stupid. That th This division is an embarrassment of riches. The embarrassing part of the Conor McGregor fiasco of the last couple of years is he stayed away from a division that is full of fantastic matchups that fans want to see. Him versus Tony Ferguson, him versus Justin Gaethje, um, Jesus, Dan Hooker, Paul Felder, name anybody in that weight class, and they're, they're really, really good. And they would all be great fights, and he's not being part of this. It's, it's Muhammad Ali competing in one of the greatest eras of heavyweight boxing. If he decided, nah, nah, I want to be a light heavyweight. I don't want to fight Sonny Liston. I want to fight Floyd Patterson. I don't want to fight George Foreman. I don't want to fight Joe Frazier. Uh, it's, it's a similar kind of thing. This is a great era of the 155-pound division, and the most marquee name at 155 pounds isn't in the mix, and that's frustrating. And if he wants to walk away now, fine, but don't sit there and tell me there aren't good matchups for me. I would argue at the highest level there's not many winnable matchups would be more – Right, right. There aren't, there aren't, there are no cupcake matchups. There are no easy matchups. But that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is there are no interesting matchups for me. That's stupid. I would agree. It's very, uh, it's tough to be a Conor McGregor fan at times. So with that said, we will move on to some people that are actually competing. Dana was very big on, you know, they don't have to fight if they don't want to fight. All the news that came out after this and the contract negotiations we're going through, maybe we'll touch on those throughout the week. Sean O'Malley, Eddie Wineland. You know, Jimmy, we talked about it in the pre-show. I know you were hamming yourself up on Twitter. I'm amazed we actually got to talk. I figured you'd throw them out your... there, dude. You know, just... Yeah. I had to Jimmy... Just, just, I'm just explaining that I got five for five on my picks, that's all. 
Bumper. Jimmy is going to be going to the urgent care to get his hand in a cast, which he's broken by patting himself on the back later shoulder. this week. A lot of shoulder issues reaching for the middle of my back. It's like a Americana on myself. Well, regardless, sorry, we haven't... You were saying? Yeah, we, we were talking about Eddie Wineland, who, you know, honestly came in, I thought, with the uh, the right mindset, obviously understood, you know, what his position was and looked looked pretty game early on, but then gets, you know, just one of these out of nowhere, unconventional Sean O'Malley moments where he just, just beyond knocks him out. And I mean, what an exciting way to finish a fight. The, the, the walk-off. I mean, he literally walked him off. It, it was... It was a moment, I will, I will say this in all sincerity, that is a moment anybody who's ever fought dreams of having. The absolute stone walk-off KO, and this guy just puts it together at the best possible time, and we learn afterwards he's <laughs> negotiating his own contracts, and it, it looks like, I want to play devil's advocate because we talked about it in the beginning, you know, this is the fight that you want to put, this is the key matchup that you would want to make, but, you know, now he has no other opportunity to see top 10, top 15 name. So, you know, we're, we're moving up into matchups that are going to be out of his control and out of favorability, if you will. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that, that's the one thing left is this was the veteran name step up showcase, I guess is a combination I would say. And he passed with flying colors. Now it's like, okay, Everybody is is clamoring for okay. What can you do against a top fifteen fringe top ten guy with some real experience in the weight class and all this kind of stuff? That's what people are asking about now. This was his last moment of obscurity, and I mean not that he was obscure before, but it's just the last moment he can get away with not taking on a a real name, a real ranked name with real danger behind him. This is his last. This was his last time he's going to do that because you know it's. I guess if there's a downside to passing your test with flying colors is you move on to the next grade and he's moving on to the next grade for sure. That's what's next for him. Where do you see him going next? I mean, are you looking at, you know, maybe Jimmy Rivera, Dodson? Is, I thought about Dodson a little bit, but is that even a step up? I may not be. Uh, it is just because he's had more success recently, I guess. Um, Chito Vera wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, yeah, one of those scrappy, tough, you know, one of those scrappy, tough guys that that can that can really put it on you is what Rob, I'm looking at now. Rob Font, um, would be a great one. Yeah, Rob Font would be great. Something like that. That that's what's going to be next for him. The kind that's not going to go down in the first round. The kind, the one that's going to make it interesting. It's going to move around. It's going to have some tricks. I like all of those. Um, so it's interesting. It's, it's, it's fascinating to me where, the, where this guy's going to go. But we've seen his ceiling is pretty damn high. Pretty damn high. I, I really believe that. Well, you know, I don't think we've ever seen Eddie Wineland get just knocked out. We don't see a lot of people get knocked out like that. Eddie Wineland is no. a durable guy. To me, a different narrative if, if Eddie Wineland drags the fight deep, gets slow. You know, you could sit there and blame the, the time off that he had. This really was everything you would want it to be and then a little bit more. For Sean O'Malley. So like you said, there, there's a lot of interesting names. They are cautiously building this hype train the right way, I feel, you know, building the name. So it is going to be interesting to see who they put them up with them next because, you know, like you said, there's uh, – by definition, there's no turning back now. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's how I feel about it. You know, it's it's once the hype train gets rolling, you, you want it to keep going. And he seems game for it. He's young. He's hungry. He's in the right spot. It's an exciting division. I think there are a lot of opportunities for him. So it's, it's you know, it, it's put up or shut up time for him in terms of real ranked guys. And, you know, we're, we're, we'll see where this guy can go. But I have faith in him. Moving up welterweight, Neil Magny, Anthony Rocco Martin. Um, really the stalling out fight of the night. It just, you know, man, ne neither guy could really get momentum going. Neither guy could get the fight going the way they wanted to go. You know, I, I will say Neil Magny did a decent job at blending his strikes in and trying to to make it into a striking bout. But, you know, Rocco Martin just continued to try to get him pressed up against the cage and, and use, you know, clinch work. And you could really just tell, you know, he was going to try to get him down to the ground. And it really just turned out to be a very... um 
unbalanced fight, I guess, would be the best way to look at it. There wasn't a lot of action, uh, and obviously the judges look at 30-27s. Somebody had a 29-28, but, you know, I guess I, I saw this a very one-sided fight, but tough for Neil Magny because this should have been an out. This isn't a performance that he looked really good, and even though he won, it's kind of like one of those Neil Magny-esque things, like you won, but... We're not, I, I'm not, your value isn't catapult, you know, isn't catapulting. Yeah. I mean, how did we break this one down? It's a veteran fight between two guys who are, can be cautious, who can uh, go in there and, and, and not take gigantic risks. This was kind of the fight we expected. And, you know, as we said, Neil Magny, kind of the veteran guy. And I thought he would have just enough to win rounds and win minutes and win the fight. And that's exactly what he did. This was the one, if you're going to tell me what's going to be this. I don't want to say snoozer because it wasn't that boring, but you know, what would be the, the most cautious fight of the night? I would have said without hesitation, no Magni. I would I Magni versus Martin. That's my, but it's a veteran kind of fight. These guys aren't out there to make a mistake and do something dumb and let somebody capitalize on them. And so that's what you got. And there's a reason Neil Magni, despite his talent and his, his obvious physical gifts and his range and all these things has never been really a contender. He's never been a guy that's in line for a title shot or anything like that. You, you saw the gifts. And you saw the reasons why he's just um, has always been a little bit shy of that elite status at 170. And, you know, the division's crowded. you got to really make your name to, in order to get anywhere. Yeah, I mean, it, honestly, the way I look at this is a great fighter, as you said, nothing to be ashamed of. But in a night where everyone made statements, he really didn't make one. Even, even with a, you know, clear-cut decision win, this isn't the – stamp my ticket, I'm moving up, I'm in line to be a title contender, and that's all there is to it, kind of performance that you expect. Yeah. And it's – it's there are wins, and then there are statement makers, and there are water cooler moments, and there are those moments everybody's talking about afterward. And no one right now is talking about the Neil Magny fight. It also has the the difficulty of being – on the same card as a bunch of knockouts and performances that were really, really great. And to be the one kind of flat performance, that doesn't help him a whole lot. You know, it's death by comparison. This was a really exciting card. And the only kind of speed bump was Magny versus Martin. Well, getting past that speed bump, Aljamain Sterling, Corey Sanhagen. We talked a lot about Aljamain in the pre-fight. We talked about how he needed to have those statement wins, how he needed to go out and cash everything in. He's been very outspoken, feels like he's been looked over. You just said, tough division, hard division to get ahead. He comes out and puts in, I would. I hate to say it, but you know, like you said, you look at another night of performances. I, I would think easily the, the number two performance of the night. I know a lot of people will go back to just the, the glaring, you know, Sean O'Malley knockout or, or obviously what Amanda did, or we'll talk about Cody in a second. But to me, the, this was not expected. This was a minute, 28 seconds of pure domination, sinks in a, a horrible choke. Corey actually goes out on the choke, and this was what we thought was going to be fight of the night. We thought this was going to be a very competitive fight, a balanced fight. We talked about game plans, and uh, Aljamain just walked in, imposed himself 100% like we rarely see. Probably could have been a bit more composed in that post-fight interview, because God knows, God knows he said some things he probably didn't mean to put in that order, but I, I will say an extremely impressive performance and this has got to get him at least in the universe of a title. I can't imagine he doesn't get a title shot within two. This was the one I was, I don't say nervous about because, you know, I don't know him that personally, but um, when we were making the picks, I was like, ah, oh, man, San Hagen, Aldermain, Sterling. And I, you know, you know, God, am I being emotional? Cause I've talked to the guy a lot in the past few weeks because, um, of this thing we're doing for Sirius XM, you know, sports on the sidelines type deal. Like, God, you know, like, yeah, I really think he can do it. But this was the one that was really like, I, I did a, a thing for a gambling show in Vegas um, this week. And I said, man, if you're, if you're going to do a parlay and you're, you're going to add some fight to it, stay away from this one. It's just either guy could win. They could win in any method, any way, at any time. Stay away from it. And he didn't just win. I thought he'd win. I thought maybe it'd be a decision. Both guys are, you know, very, very tough and experienced. And he just blew him out of the water. Nobody expected that. Nobody. That was the thing that as as close as this fight was perceived by everybody who had a two brain cells to rub together, it was also a, 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 an incredible performance because of that. I thought this would be razor thin, and it was a wash. That is craziness. 
yeah, good old Jimmy the Greek Smith over here was telling, and I was too, you know, stay away from this fight. Yeah, and everybody was. Everybody was, right. It's not just us. C- could not have looked more unbalanced, to be fair. Yeah, it was, it was, it was nuts. So to me, it was, it was, man, talk about statement wins to take on a guy as good as Sanhagen and just blow him out of the water and, and physically dominate and technically dominate and do it so quickly. If he doesn't get a title shot off this, if he isn't next in line after the title shot, after the the title fight between Jan and and Aldo, they're never going to give him a title shot. He will just never get one. He's just, you know, unpopular with UFC brass. He'll never get one if he doesn't get one off this. You can't make a better impression. Yeah, agreed, agreed entirely. So obviously one of the great things about MMA in general, well, really combat sports in general, is you can be wrong. And Jimmy, I was absolutely wrong about Cody Garbrandt. I thought that the emotions, a lot of things would factor into this fight. And, you know, he came out. He did a very good job at looking fresh, looking sharp. Uh, Looked like the best version of Cody Garbrandt we'd seen. And at the end of the second round, he pulls down from his knee and just knocks Rafael Asuncel out cold. And, you know, it was one of those things where you see it and you're like, did did that just happen? Did he just knock him out with literally a millisecond left to go? I believe Keith Peterson was the referee. There was no question. The fight was over. You know, it was at the buzzer, right. but we all knew, like, oh, no. Sometimes, you know, when you have those flash knockouts or, or knockdowns sometimes, even at the end of a round, you question, like, oh, he'll, he'll get back up. They'll, they'll drag him over to his stool, and he'll be okay. This one we knew. No, it, it's over. And uh, Cody Garbrandt makes a very, very much needed comeback win in really a Cody Garbrandt fashion with that boxing style we talked about earlier in the in the preview. But – what are the differences? That's the issue to me. Is what are the differences? Cody Garbrandt took his time. He had fought at a measured pace. He fought very, very smart. He didn't rush anything, right? All these things we were worried about from the beginning with Cody Garbrandt, he's managed a lot of those things. Or it appears right now he's managed. And we'll have to, you know, see in a couple of fights how it goes. But you know, he looked patient. This wasn't a wild man out there throwing bombs and really emotional about the fight. He was cool. He was calm. He was taking his time. He was counting well. He was looking for opportunities. This is a, a guy who can do very, 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 very well in this division because, you know, maybe now the IQ matches the physical talent we've known that we've always known he has. So it's not about, to me, what he did. It's also about what he didn't do, which is rush and fight emotionally and wild. And he didn't do any of that stuff. So I was impressed with all, thing, all the things I saw from him. You know the last time we saw a card where it was main event uh, heavy with one weight class? I, at this point, you know, you realize we watched three out of four Bantamweight fights. That normally doesn't happen. Yeah, no, it was, it was like a Grand Prix. That's what it felt like. It felt like a Grand Prix. It felt like a tournament. You know, winner gets a title shot, kind of throwback to, to the pride days and stuff like that. That's how it felt to me. It really did because there's so many guys from the same weight class on the card. You know, do you think that doesn't help the card? Do, do you feel like, you know, all Jermaine doesn't sit back there and watch what a guy like Sean O'Malley does and say, OK, I, I got to go one up this. And then Cody sits back and says, you know what? I, I got to one up both of them. And, and you get kind of like that mid card building of, of an event that we normally don't see. Like you, you mentioned, a lot of times with the Grand Prix, you get that that tension, that next fight up, that building suspense that we normally don't see when it's all mixed weight classes. Don't get me wrong. It's great that. A lot of times these cards tell a story and we build from one fight to the next. But I really thought after this fight, like, man, I, I would love to see another Bantamweight fight, but that's not going to be what's coming up next. Right. And I, I do agree with you in a sense that the, that the, the, um, the, 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 the one-upsmanship, it's in training, it's in the fight, it's in the room as you're waiting for the fight, it's everywhere. And that's important, right? In training camp, we go, look, I can't just win. I got to make the UFC brass think I'm the shit. I got to really make them think I'm something, something special. If I want this title shot, man, what if O'Malley gets a walkaway knockout? I need a walkaway knockout. What if so-and-so gets this? It pushes everybody in the same direction. It's almost like having a bunch of guys training for the same card at the same time. And it's just Shark Tank and everybody's, you know, 
trying to outdo one another. That's what it's all about, man, to me. So it, it didn't just push them that night. It pushed them during the training camp, I'm sure. You think the coaches weren't talking about, hey, look, this is a night full of Bantamweights. You want to be the one Bantamweight to get a decision? No, you don't. Penny agrees. And so, you know, that's how it feels to me about everything. Everything. It's all about pushing each other. And that's the excitement of having all those people on the same card. Yeah, I, I agree. It really did seem like it was culminating into something special. And it does because Amanda Nunes comes out, Felicia Spencer, and man. I don't want to say that Felicia didn't belong there, okay? We talked about it in the pre-show. Listen, she she's there because she is the next girl up. Make no mistake. The girls that were in front of her, she beat. She earned this position. She had every right to be in the cage that night fighting for a championship. But the problem is Amanda Nunes is just that good. She is just that good. I mean, she did not even look like she had been in a fight after this. There was not one time I feared for Amanda Nunes. There was not one time I said, well, this is where the tide's going to turn. I, it is one of those proverbial beat her from pillar to post. There wasn't even a time where I thought Felicia Spencer was mounting offense. I was wondering what her corner was talking about. Like, at some point, you have to just throw caution to the wind and say, I, I have to now win both of the last two rounds convincingly. What I've just done for the last three rounds that got me beat up is not functioning and not working. And it never, I don't want to say that she wasn't coming out and trying different things. I don't want to say that she wasn't giving her different looks. It, Amanda Nunes walked through her. She stood there at every pass she could and said, no, I, I will be the dominant fighter. To the point that, you know, we heard the rumblings. We heard the comparisons. I saw Anthony Smith on Twitter. You know, when, when do we stop fights? When do we throw in towels? And, and I hate that it gets brought up again, but, you know, I, I think if nothing else, that speaks to how brutal this fight was to watch, how one-sided it was to watch. It wasn't a bloody mess, but it was an uncompetitive fight. That's the difference to me. 100%. That's the difference to me. When I talked about, you know, I, I, I didn't know what I, I think I actually tweeted was, I don't need to see a round five here. I'm okay with this ending right now. I do not need to see round five. It wasn't that, I mean, she was getting beaten up. Let, let's be honest. She was getting beaten up. The Glover to share an Anthony Smith fight was difficult to watch. Anthony, I thought, was taking a beating that really affects you in your career. I really, I really believed he was taking that kind of beating. Talking about his teeth getting knocked out and stuff. I know some of them were veneers, but he did lose some real teeth. It wasn't that kind of a beating. It was a beating. It wasn't, oh, my God, this is hard to watch kind of beating. It was one fighter totally outclassed. There was no path to victory. There was nothing she could do to win that fight. That's why I wouldn't have allowed it to continue if I were her coach. I go, look, I've seen enough. We know how this is going to go. She tactically, tactically had no way back into this fight. She was up against a better fighter. End of story. In every way. Remember, the only way, and only any the only way any reasonable person thought Felicia Spencer was going to win this fight was on the ground. Right? She takes her down, she gets on top, she gets a submission. Amanda Nunes took her down at will. Stopped all of her takedowns like nothing. Almost tapped her out at the end of round four through a naked choke. Even the thing you're great at, you're getting your ass kicked at. She looked like she didn't belong in there with her in terms of her ability to, to, to physically and tactically keep up with the man in Nunes. It wasn't there. So that's why I wouldn't have allowed the fight to continue. Not so much that, I mean, yeah, she was taking a beating, but it wasn't the savagery of the beating, of the beating as much as the, the disparity in technical skill. I think to me, the, these things come down to, you know, if you've trained, you've no doubt went against somebody that is of a higher level than you. There's no two ways around it. And in essence, it's not that they toy with you, but anything that you do to them, they allow you to do in an effort of teaching, in an effort of you getting better. And when you watch, when you've been in that situation, you can watch fights play out that way. And that fifth round, I'm sorry, Amanda was not actively trying to finish. She was not actively 110% kill shot every single step. She was literally just passively letting the fight end. 
And that is not good for anyone. As you said, if you had not had that fifth round, there's four rounds that, you know, Felicia can go back with her camp and assess, okay, here's all the areas we need to get better. And trust me, there's a lot of them if you feel like you're going to be competitive with Amanda Nunes. But I don't like to see any fight, much less a championship fight, have that coach versus student feel to it. And, and this very much did, as that fight progressed, lend itself to Amanda just saying, hey, listen, you, you can't hurt me. I know that you can't hurt me. We're going to go through the motions of this round, and then I'm going to get my hand raised. Yeah. I had an old boxing coach who was almost like a Roy Jones. He was so fast and athletic and, and powerful, and he was a phenomenal boxer. And whenever you would land a punch on him, you'd hear, oh, all right, then. And whenever he said, oh, all right, then, you're like, oh, crap. And he would unload and hit you with a 10-punch combination, and you didn't see any of them. And he would remind you, you're not on my level. You're not, you're not, you're not on my level. He would just Roy Jones your ass. And that disparity was, was, you rarely see it at the pro level. You rarely see it at the championship level. I Meaning by the time someone's usually good enough to get a title shot, they're at least on that level. And let's face it, Amanda Nunez is at least one level above everybody at 135 and 145. The hard part is Felicia Spencer ha deserved to be there. She's probably the number two fighter in the world in women's MMA at 145 pounds. At, in the UFC, I think Cyborg is still probably number two. But even then, the gulf is huge. And that's what all-time greats do. GSP in his run, you know, took, off, took on the greatest of all time, some of the greatest in the history of the 170-pound division, and made them look like they didn't belong in there. Not a knock on them. That's why he's amongst, amongst the greatest. Just like Anderson Silva, just like Fedor, they took on the best and made it look like, geez, what is this person even doing in there? That's what we're seeing. We're seeing history from Amanda Nunes, one of the greatest of all time. I, I couldn't agree more. If you're a casual fan and you're watching that card, and I say that because somebody was covering this sport for the first time last night and just going crazy on Twitter thinking this is how they all go. You're watching this fight. You're seeing these competitive moments. You're watching this build up to the championship fight. And then you get that. It has to be confusing. It has to be confusing. Where, okay, so wait a second. That was number one versus number two because that looked like it was, you know, number one versus number 20. But that's just how great Amanda is. We don't, like you said, we don't normally see it. Things like that are generally reserved for a closed gym sparring session where someone's learning, someone's being trained. And to see it at that level, it's really, it, it's scary for anyone else, but it is so impressive to watch somebody come out and just 25 minutes of pure dominance. I'm going to let you do whatever you want to try to do. I'm going to beat you at your own game, and then I'm going to pick up my game, and I'm going to beat you with that too. I don't even know how, if you're Felicia Spencer, I don't even know how you begin to break down a game plan to beat her the next time. Because as you said, we talked about earlier, the only way we thought this could be a problem for Amanda is if she got on bottom. And honestly, she walked through everything Felicia had. She nullified every takedown. It was a master class in how to defend your championship. Or, or win any fight, for that matter. Set championships out of it. Yeah. And I, I we talk about what's next. And, you know, I got asked that question today. Or what's the next one? Yeah, I did this morning. And I said, does it matter? Does it matter? You put a gun to my head said, who's next in 145? I'll name somebody. It doesn't matter. Father Time is going to have to catch up with Amanda Nunes. She's going to have some, some crazy personal problem that's going to distract her. You know, motherhood, you know, take some of her time away. I know they want to have a baby later this year or something like that. It's going to take something outside of training and fighting to beat Amanda Nunes. There's going to be some help, some divine intervention. She gets old, she gets injured, I don't know, something else. That's what's going to have to happen. And it's crazy, but it's true. All right, so with that said, we appreciate you guys checking this out. And you know we will be back very shortly with more commentary.